Movie footage used in the kill count is owned entirely by the copyright holders. Dead Meat makes no claim of ownership and simply uses the footage for purposes of education, commentary, and criticism under fair use. Please support filmmakers and the art of filmmaking by watching Saw 3D in its entirety on home media or streaming services where available. Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Saw 3D, also known as Saw the Final Chapter, a subtitle that was rendered illegitimate with last year's Jigsaw. Saw 3D was meant to be the final Saw film after Part 6 didn't do so hot at the box office, so writers Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstan tried to pull out all the stops to wrap things up, even bringing back Doc Gordon to help with this movie's twist ending. Unfortunately, Saw 3D feels like a movie from a different series, and that is not meant as a compliment. From obnoxious new characters, to Mark Hoffman turning into a cheesy slasher killer, for me, Saw 3D pretty much ruins the convoluted horror soap opera that I've come to know and love. It also has a real cheap look to it, a serious lack of John Kramer, and a strangely angry attitude towards women. But people who love gore will probably be satisfied, because believe it or not, this movie has kills so ridiculously gory that they managed to stand out in a series known as being torture porn. So let's quit yapping and take a look at them. The movie begins with a recap of the first one? What? Yep, because we follow a bloody trail on the floor to a footless body crawling away. Fun fact, this explains the blood streak Strom found in the tunnels at the end of Saw 5. And that blood streak belongs to Dr. Lawrence Gordon, our pallid hero from the first movie. Turns out he survived by cauterizing his stump against a hot metal pipe. Good to have you back, dude. You look just like I remember. Now we're in a very public setting where bystanders notice one of them newfangled saw traps behind a big store display window. Two young bros, Brad and Ryan, wake up handcuffed to a workbench with circular saws near their faces. Above and between them is a woman, Dina, who both of them address as their girlfriend. After a very poor attempt by the spectators to break the glass, why are you using the flat end of a soft leather briefcase, lady? Billy straight up rides a tricycle into the trap room and addresses the boys. He says Dina has been dating and manipulating both of them. Causing nothing but pain. Her fun and games pushed you both to break the law to fulfill her material needs. She is toxic. Now the three of them are in this trap and one of them has to die. And it's boy's choice tonight. If they want to save Dina and be with her, they'll have to overpower and kill the other lover. Otherwise, they can choose to both live if they leave the saw in the middle as she descends onto it. A 60 second timer begins and the saws rev up. The boys begin duking it out in this trap that's on public display for seriously no freaking reason. It's never addressed again and I don't even know why Hoffman and or Jigsaw would take the time to set this up, but whatever. Dina alternately roots for whoever seems to be winning at the moment to show how sleazy and duplicitous she is, you know? As if you couldn't tell by her torn open shirt. Eventually, the boys agree that Dina just isn't worth it. I think we're breaking up with you, Dina! Ugh, and they put the saw back in the middle. When the timer runs out, she drops down onto the saw, and it cuts through a pretty fake-looking midsection, spraying blood everywhere. Aw, oh, even over Billy? Eventually, the buzz saw cuts deep enough to kill her, and Dina becomes the first of many kills ahead. Let's 3D into a title car! Yeah! Saw 3D! Well, now we're down the drain! Previously on Saw. Jill stuck Hoffman's head in the reverse bear trap, and turns out she was actually witness to his desperate but effective move to stop his head from blowing up. That sent her running, if that's what you want to call it, and hiding from Hoffman as he left the building and returned to a spare Billy Part warehouse to stitch up his face. Jill goes to the police and specifically requests to talk to new character Matt Gibson of Internal Affairs. Really wish you had asked for anyone else, Jill, because all this guy knows how to do is leer at lady co-workers and call you crazy all the time. She looks crazier in a sack full of cats. He's played by Chad Donella, the dude from Final Destination, that you forgot was in Final Destination. In exchange for protection and complete immunity, Jill tells Gibson that Detective Mark Hoffman is her ex-husband's accomplice and will go on killing if he's not stopped. Meanwhile, Hoffman's taking steps to ensure he won't be traced. Hope you stocked up on beer before you burnt that ID, dude. The other awful new character in this movie, besides Gibson, is Bobby Dagan, a guy who's currently on a media tour promoting the book he wrote about surviving a jigsaw trap. He did so by sticking a couple of hooks into his pecs and hoisting himself up to a platform. The whole experience really moved him. Because I hadn't just survived Survived. I was reborn. The interview is a downright whirlwind of pathos, but Bobby's publicist Nina is still upset that he didn't follow the script and end with a big loving kiss to his supportive wife Joyce. Joyce is a very loving spouse who believes in Bobby entirely and just wants to help him succeed. Sure would suck if something fucking awful happened to such a nice character, wouldn't it? Speaking of nice characters, Jill leaves the police station late at night only to get oinked right off her feet. She wakes up in a revealing pink nightie and globs of lip gloss to Hoffman lamenting that he can 
can only kill her once before releasing a crazy Pinewood Death Derby card on her. It runs at her in spectacular 3D, and when it finally makes contact, it tears her into pieces. Holy shit! And yes, there's a fake boob as part of the body parts. So I guess I was technically wrong about the female nudity fun fact back in Saw 3. Either way, this shit ain't real. Jill wakes up in bed fully embodied. Saw has never had a dream sequence like that before, and it feels kind of cheap. Come on, Saw, blow our minds with convoluted plot twists, not Hoffman's boner revenge fantasies. Or you could always fall back on gruesome traps, like this one set for Evan, a neo-Nazi played by the late Chester Bennington of Lincoln Park. Rest in peace, dude. The tape in his car says that he, his girlfriend, and his friends are all in a big old Rube Goldberg saw trap because of their racism, and the only way Evan can save them is by pulling the red lever that's just outside the windshield. The only problems are, dude is super glued to the seat of this car, and he's only got 30 seconds. Not much time to save his skinhead brethren Dan and Jake, or his girlfriend Kara, played by another Scream Queens winner, Gabby West. You're probably crawling in your skin, watching him rip away from the car seat. He gets one arm free, and as he rips the second arm away, he's one step closer to the lever, but his skin's about to break. He tries so hard and gets so far, but in the end, it doesn't even matter. The timer runs out and all of them die. Kara gets her head smashed by the car tire. Dan's freaking arms and jaw are ripped straight off. The car plows straight into Jake and through the garage door he was against, and the final car crash sends Evan sailing out through his own windshield and in through another car's, killing him and finishing off the deadly garage trap. The police wind up at the crime scene and try to put the pieces back together. Gibson finds a message for him from Hoffman saying, yo, check this shit out, and it's the motherfucking reverse bear trap! Jill Tuck's fingerprints are on it because of that whole, you know, trying to kill Hoffman thing, so Gibson takes her to a safe house where he yells at her and calls her crazy some more. You're crazy. I knew you were crazy the minute I laid eyes on you. Crazy. Real charmer of a guy. But it looks like that house ain't all that safe, since IA officer Palmer shows up with the DVD that Hoffman sent them at that location. On it, he says that if they don't give him Jill, he'll, uh, kill everyone? He's fucking crazy enough to mean it, too. Check out this bomb that goes off at the garage crime scene. When did Hoffman become a terrorist? With the threat level at red, Gibson sticks Jill inside a jail cell, Jill cell? For protection instead, with this dude Officer Rogers to watch over her. Bobby Dagan attends a saw trap survivor support group at a church where a woman, Sydney, recounts her story. Apparently, she and her abusive boyfriend, Alex, wound up hanging over a whole bunch of green screened in lawnmowers whose blades they were a whirling. Sydney managed to win the trap by slapping Alex in the face, causing him to fall down into the dozens of blades below and killing him off screen with nothing more than a nasty spray of blood. Sydney claims that the moment empowered her, which is great for all the TV cameras Bobby has running, but Simone from Saw 6 ain't buying it. That's a bunch of bullshit. She says that as far as she's concerned, there was only one upside to having to cut off her own arm. Handicap parking at the damn mall! This is a fun scene, since it has cameos for minor characters of the last couple of films, such as Malik, who survived the hand-mangling buzzsaw at the end of Saw 5, and a bunch of survivors from Saw 6, including Addie, Will's secretary, Tara Abbott, who's not a murderer, and Emily, who survived the shotgun carousel. Also in attendance are Ryan and Brad from this movie's beginning. Bobby gives a rousing speech and even pulls a Joe Bluth to show off the pec scars from his trap. Come on! Best of all, he sticks the landing with a made-for-TV smooch to his wife Joyce, but in response, he gets a hilarious hilarious slow clap from the back of the room. Sitting in the shadows, growling his way through his dialogue, is the one-footed wonder Lawrence Gordon. My name is Lawrence Gordon. I'm a doctor. He's a doctor. And he starts a sarcastic clap for Bobby and the book tour promo he's shooting before he leaves with a disgusted grimace. Bobby's best bro and center part enthusiast, Cal, is concerned about Doc Shady, but the Bobster says it's cool. Dr. Gordon's an OG regular at these meetings. Bobby leaves the church only to find his wife missing from the car, having been replaced by a side of pork. Pig! He wakes up in a metal cage, and Billy pops up to tell him that, congratulations, Bobby, you're this movie's Jeff. And why was he chosen for this illustrious honor? Well, Billy says because he's a big fat liar. You are a liar. You and I both know you have never been in a trap, nor have you ever been tested. Yep, just paint him blue and call him the wolf, because he's been lying to everyone about being a J-Saw victim. Turns out he got the idea back in the day when he couldn't afford a decent haircut and passed his time eating free bar peanuts. He cribbed the whole Jigsaw made me better thing from a real trap victim he saw on the news. It also turns out that John Kramer had pretty much warned him against lying about this, as we see in a flashback at a Bobby Dagan book signing. John had just gotten out of Little League practice and came to the signing to intimate to Bobby that he knew he was lying about his experiences. Now Bobby's facing punishment for his deception. His wife 
Joyce has been captured, and if he can't reach her within 60 minutes, he will die. Wait, no? She will die. No. She will die? What the fuck? His cage becomes a roller coaster cart, and then he's almost dropped down over spikes, but Bobby manages to swing himself to safety. Good thing, since his completely innocent wife Joyce is subjected to watching him on a monitor, and I wouldn't want her to have to see or experience anything awful. Bobby follows a pink line on the ground to find his publicist Nina in a trap that, I mean, just looking at it? Where the fuck's that string going, dude? I don't like this at all. An x-ray shows my instincts were right. Wow, this trap is gonna be rough to watch. Bobby's job is to fish out that key within 60 seconds. Or else the four spikes will penetrate her throat, silencing Mina forever. Get it? Because she's a publicist, and this trap will make her speak no more evil. Oh, and also, if they're too loud, the spikes will move in as well. Dude, fuck this trap. The timer starts, and I can hardly stand to watch as Bobby takes turns yanking at the cord and silencing Nina's screams to prevent the spikes from closing in on her. And for everyone criticizing her yelling, you try to be silent while your insides get flossed with a fish hook. Eventually, Bobby tears out the key. Unfortunately, it's too late, and Nina is forever silenced by her throat getting quadra-stabbed. Bobby is less than respectful of the dead. Why wouldn't you just shut the fuck up? All right, dude, she's dead. The next trap Bobby comes across has his lawyer Suzanne strapped to a wheel, and in an effort to outdo his noose entrance from Saw 6, Billy crashes into the room inside a puppet-sized birdcage and tells Bobby that since his lawyer chose to see no evil, the wheel she's strapped to will rotate her into these eye and mouth gouging pipes. To stop the device from rotating, Bobby's got to do some calf raises on a stabby machine. The trap begins and the wheel starts rotating, so Bobby steps up to the plate and lifts bro, getting a couple of pokes in the ribs for his troubles, but he's unable to hold it up long enough to stop the inevitable 3D death device. And Suzanne is killed when the trap rotates her all the way into the spikes and impales her to death through the eyes and mouth. Jesus Christ. We've had speak no evil and see no evil, so now we need hear no evil. Enter Cal, even though his blindfold makes you think this would be see no evil. Across from you is your closest friend. He knows all your sins, yet he acts as though he hears no evil. Oh, okay. Seems a little forced, but sure. Cal's on the other side of this room that looks like you need a portal gun to cross, but since the cake is a lie, Cal will instead have to listen carefully to Bobby's directions if he wants to safely make it across. That's the only way he'll get the noose around his neck off, since Bobby will have to meet him halfway after grabbing the key for it. Oh yeah, and all of this has to be done within 60 seconds. The timer starts, and Bobby does a decent job instructing Cal across a couple of planks. Bobby's even able to get the key, but then the timer gets close to running out, so he resorts to tossing the key at Cal. The blindfolded Leafy Green fails to catch the 3D key, which falls to the floor below, and with time all out, Cal is lifted into the air and hanged to death, looking kinda like he's wearing one-fifth of a Pulp Fiction gimp costume there. Hoffman sends Gibson a video as an email attachment, wherein he gives Gibson a cryptic clue. Look beyond the crossroad to the clear dawn. Gibson follows that clue to Crossroads Manufacturing, an abandoned warehouse where, back when Gibson first started, he was attacked by a vagrant, as we see in this flashback. After the vagrant pulled his own gun on him, Gibson was saved by Detective Mark Hoffman, who got the suspect disarmed and neutralized before straight up murdering him with three gunshots through the back. Holy shit! Shit, Hoffman, can we get a body cam on this guy? Cause that is one clear-cut case of police brutality. Hoffman treated it like a favor, but Gibson was shook and transferred to internal affairs, as he tells Roger in the present, and started busting Hoffman's corrupt underling cops. Gibson sends Rogers back to guard Jill as he follows the other part of Hoffman's clue, Clear Dawn, which leads him to Clear Dawn Psychiatric Hospital, an abandoned psych ward that we've been watching Bobby make his way through this entire movie. The cops do their cop thing all over the place, and eventually find Nina's body. When Gibson gets a call from Palmer saying the video email was sent from Pete's auto body, the site of the neo-Nazi garage trap. Gibson leaves to head there while his police dudes continue deeper into the hospital, finding both Suzanne's and Cal's body in the process. Gibson gets to the auto shop, where he stumbles across a hidden door leading to a tunnel. Not the infamous tunnels, but at least it's still green. At the end of it, he finds who he believes to be Hoffman sitting at a computer in a golden era jigsaw robe. But when he approaches and then kicks the figure, it turns out to be the corpse of Dan Dan the Nazi man, the dude who got de-jawed in the garage trap. Looks like Hoffman had tapped into security cams to watch the police this whole time. When he set off that junkyard bomb, he swapped places with Dan here, so it looks like he scored a free one-way ticket in a body bag to the police department. Gibson tries to call the station and tell them that, but it's too late. A freaking machine gun pops up, like the one on the Maximum Overdrive Jeep, and just mows down Gibson and two of his cop buddies, even though the second one tries to jump out of the way. The important thing here is that Gibson is done in this movie, thank God. Back at the station, the coroner Dr. Hefner, who was around in Saws 4 and 6, if we want to give credit where it's due, goes to open the body bag, only to find a very lively Hoffman and a knife to the neck. Damn. Dr. 
Hefner, deceased. Cause of death, a knife in the neck delivered by the fucking Terminator once known as Mark Hoffman. The Hoffmanator continues his kill streak with this other corner worker dude when he walks into the wrong place at the wrong time. Same method too. Hoffman, you crazy man, just stabbing shins and shit. Crazy like a sack of cats or whatever Gibson said. Hoffman's even able to score five more kills remotely when a trap goes off where the SWAT team is and they all get poisoned by a bunch of hydrogen cyanide gas. I read from the internet and hope is correct. Oh, I'm sorry. Did y'all think Hoffman was done killing people? Nah, man, he's nonstop. He just sneaks up on a lawyer guy in the police station and puts a knife in his throat just like he did to the morgue crew. Hoffy, why do you stab like you're running out of time? Especially since there are other ways to kill people, like snapping their necks. He tries that one out on Palmer after a short little struggle with her and it works real well. See, dude? Much less blood all over your hoodie. He uses Palmer's corpse to gain access to the jail cell Jill Tuck is in and then he's right back to the chin stabs with this random police officer guy. So many random cops dead in this movie. Generic city about to be paying widows by the truckload. He takes the rando's gun and aims through the two-way mirror to shoot Detective Rogers through the eye, killing him instantly and leaving Jill Tuck without any kind of protection against this insanely successful murdery man. She is able to conceal a blade behind her back before he comes for her, and after he gets too close for comfort, she sticks him in the neck with it and gets away from him. But Jill, this is no mere man we're dealing with anymore. It's the Hoffmanator. She tries to run, if that's what you want to call it, and hide, but in a very weirdly directed or edited scene, he follows her and finds her. I think the actors weren't actually together at all for these shots, because look, in the only shot of them together, when he kicks her, it looks like a Betsy Russell stunt double. Bobby, meanwhile, gets to a room where Billy pops up to say that if he wants to go through the door that'll lead to his wife, he'll have to get the combination that'll open it by pulling out two of his teeth since the numbers have been etched into them. After a whole bunch of yanking and blood, Bobby is able to get one tooth out on his own, but for the second, he has to use some simple physics and the force of a wall to assist him with the dental procedure. Saw 7 is so gross that it's painful to watch even when the gore isn't that explicit. With both teeth extracted and both numbers revealed, Bobby gets through the door and finally finds Joyce, whose chain has been pulled underground so she's been stuck on her hands and knees this whole movie. Great. Bobby's still unable to get to her because of some real live wires, and after that unpleasant shock, Billy appears on a TV to tell him that his final task is the very trap he made up and wrote a book about. Pierce the hooks through your chest muscles, and the game will begin. To save himself and Joyce, he's gotta hoist himself up with the chains and plug in a loose cable. Bobby said in his book that your pecs can support your body weight, but now it's time for him to test that myth and see if it gets busted. Before he begins his ascent, Bobby comes clean to Joyce about how he was never really in a trap, which totally ruins her day. Hope things don't get any worse for her. Then Bobby jobs it up some more, come on, and pierces his chest with the hooks as Joyce roots him on. It takes him a really long time, but eventually he's able to hoist himself all the way up to where that fire hazardous extension cable is. Unfortunately, when he lets both his hands go to plug in the stinger, his pecs don't hold up and he falls to the ground with no time left to try again. He watches helplessly as the timer runs out and the platform Joyce is on turns into a fucking brazen bull, one of the most horrific torture traps from the actual real world and she is burned alive inside of it. This has got to be the biggest what the fuck for me in this entire series. Why do we got to watch this lady's skin melt because her husband was a charlatan? Damn Saw 3D, you one nasty son of a bitch. Hoffman inflicts some more violence against Jill Tuck and then straps her into a chair like she had done to him in the previous movie. Instead of going with the same model bear trap that she used on him though, he picks out the John Kramer classic model and affixes that around her head instead. With no chance to escape, Jill is treated to the usual series of flashbacks and saw theme underscoring as the bear trap timer runs out and we finally see it in action. It lives up to the hype that it built up over seven movies. So much in fact that I need to censor a bunch of these shots in the public version of this video. Super sorry folks, but it is graphic. Go watch the movie to see it in all its glory. With his revenge finally taken on Jill, Hoffman delivers the jigsaw catchphrase. Game over. He heads back to his hideout where he gets all splashy splashy with the gasoline again and then lights it all ablaze. Continuing the action movie aesthetic of this film, Hoffman walks away without looking at the explosion. But little does he know, he's got three little pigs waiting for him. They beat him up a little and stab him in the neck with some drugs. And who was that plunger happy pig head? None other than Dr. Lawrence Gordon. Since this was supposed to be the big Saw series finale, we get an extended flashback explaining this twist. Starting with the package that Jill dropped off in Gordon's office in the last movie. It had a tape of John Kramer calling Gordon his greatest asset. He had found Gordon alive in the tunnels and nursed him back to health, even fitting him with a new foot. Turns out Gordon has assisted him the entire series in everything from sewing the key under Mike's eye for the Venus flytrap in the beginning of Saw 2, to recommending Lynn for Jigsaw's brain surgery in Saw 3, to sewing up Trevor's eyes for that winch trap that opened Saw 4. Hell, turns out it was Gordon who wrote the note to Hoffman saying he knew who he was. Not Strom like Hoffman thought when he found the letter in Saw 5. And since John asked Gordon to watch over Jill, now Gordon's cap 
capturing Hoffman with two other pig heads, who are never revealed, but in the audio commentary, they say it's Brad and Ryan, the two bros from The Public Trap in the beginning of this film. The movie ends in the place where it all began. You know what those lights mean. We're back in the shit room, and thank God, we haven't made a pit stop here since Saw 4, and I had to go. Hoffman wriggles over to the hacksaw, but Gordon pulls it away and regards it like an old friend, before removing the option entirely for Hoffman. I don't think so. He throws it at the audience through the power of 3D, says a fond farewell to his disembodied foot, then turns the lights off on Detective Mark Hoffman. No! Game over. No! I thought long and hard about putting Hoffman on the list, but I'm gonna hold off, since another Saw movie is planned, and my suspicions are that he'll return. Don't worry, there were enough kills on the count without him. I'll show you at the numbers. Whoa, 3D! Haha, <laughs> yeah, was it like I was coming out of the screen at you? I bet it was. <laughs> 26 people died in Saw 3D, twice the number of the previous high mark for the series. Of the victims, 19 were men and 7 were women, a more than 2 to 1 ratio of more dudes. With a runtime of 90 minutes, that comes out to a kill on average every 3.47 minutes? Holy shit, Hoffman! I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Jill Tuck. Yeah, I can barely show anything in the public version, and I'm sorry about that, but that's just how cool this kill is. Dull machete for lamest hmm. kill goes to the 5 SWAT officers who are poisoned to death. That's no fun at all, Hoffy. At least your other ambush trap had a friggin' machine gun. Platinum punji sticks for coolest trap will go to the impalement wheel. It seemed like one of the few traps that was possibly doable, although, I don't know, those side stabs might have been too much for anyone to overcome. I just love calf raises, they're one of my favorite exercises. Rusty mouse trap for lamest trap will go to the brazen bull. Like, yeah, it's horrific, but not in a fun way, and it turns out Joyce didn't have much of a chance at all, since the pec muscles proved to not have enough sheer strength for the task. I'm giving every unnamed Saw sequel a subtitle to help it stand out, and although Saw 7 is named Saw 3D, what if we called it Saw 3D? Liar, liar, wife on fire. And that's it! Saw 3D was written to be the end of the series, and for seven years it was, until Jigsaw was released to continue the story, kinda but not really. I'll show you what I mean next week, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching today's Kill Count. Today, I want to thank my live stream moderators. I do a lot of live streams if you didn't notice, sometimes gaming, but mostly editing to show you guys how the kill counts get made. And during those live streams, I have a team of moderators who work tirelessly to make sure that the streams are a nice place to be. They're all really wonderful people who care about me and the work that I'm doing here on Dead Meat. You the best mods. Thanks everyone, be good people.